I'm doing this story because I actually went to a predominantly white school from first to 12th grade. Um, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, and my school back home sent out alumni sent a letter to head of school. And I was like, oh, I wonder if, you know, more people are doing this. A lot of private schools in the area of Charleston, I heard started doing that. And I was like, well, let me see if anybody here in Virginia, where I'm at right now, if they're doing the same thing. And I was scrolling social media. I came across Natalie's post um, just about how you guys actually put together a letter. I know the two Natalie's and Kristen uh, put together that letter, sent it out, and it had, what, around 180 signatures passed around to alumni, former employees, some parents as well, basically calling out the school, saying that their first statement calling them out and calling for change, um, bringing the awareness up with, you know, systemic racism at school. So that's what the story, that's what I'm doing. And um, I just want whoever wants to speak first, why did you feel the need to send this letter out to head of school? Why was it so important for you? And if you didn't craft it, and if you signed it, why was it so important to sign? Whoever wants to go. Mm, I guess I guess I'll go first. Okay. I don't I don't hear any other takers. So, my name's Angel Richardson Mickens. Um, I am class of 2007. I went to Cape Henry from 2000 until 2007. So seven years through middle school and high school. Um, I was on full uh, financial aid. They of course presented it to me as a scholarship and not financial aid. Which looking back, I realized was their way of making me feel included and not feel like I was less than or didn't belong there. Um, anyone who remembers me from middle school or high school probably knows that I wasn't the easiest to deal with. I always <laughs> had uh, quite an opinion about everything. And I can say in the seven years I spent at Cape Henry, every time I brought anything to the table, I, I can't say I got everything I want. I can say I, they always listened to everything I had to say. And they always took any concerns I had seriously. And so Cape Henry was my um, second home, sometimes even my first home, it felt like. Um, I can say in seven years there, um, I never felt like I didn't belong. And I was very different from everyone who went there for a lot of reasons, not just because of my color, but also because of my socioeconomic, socioeconomic background. I probably should have felt like a fish out of water, but I didn't. Um, that the faculty there and the students there and the parents there always welcomed me with open arms and made me feel like I belong there. Um, I'll start with that. Did you ever, you said that you always felt that you belong. Did you ever see any systemic racism while you were at school or is that something that you noticed after graduating and just getting older? Probably after I graduated and got older. Um, any issues that arose while I were while I was there, um, I can't think of an issue where I ever had to go to uh, anyone for any for any racism issues. To be perfectly honest with you, and if there was any ever, ever any ever if there ever was a time where I didn't feel comfortable or feel like I wasn't being treated fairly, I had a voice. I could go right to the dean or the headmaster. In fact, the headmaster that was there when I. Uh, first got there, which was Dr. Richardson. I knew him very well, and I used to go to his office all the time, and I'm sure he probably thought I was a pain in the butt, but anytime I had a concern, he always listened to what I had to say. So I will say there probably was systematic racism. Did I feel that while I was there? Not really. Um, I'm sure there have been a lot of changes made since I left, and maybe other people's um, uh, experience will be different than mine, but I only have really good things to say about Cape Henry. I mean, I definitely couldn't have afforded to go there had they not accepted me um, and paid for my school lunch and my books. And I went to Africa two times, you know, wow. just, I mean, I could go on and on and on about all of the things and the blessing that Cape Henry was to me in my life. So. While, yeah, there probably was some systematic uh, systemic racism, 
it wasn't nearly as prevalent as I think it could have been or was at other places in that during that time frame. Yeah. And just, you know, other people in the group right now, how, if you could just talk to me about how your experience was at Cape Henry, how many years were you there? Um, like I just asked Angel, if this is something that systemic racism, did you notice any of that while you were there? Or is this something that you noticed after graduating, if anyone wants to speak? Uh, I can speak to that. Uh, Alex Spruill, class of 2007. I was at Cape Henry from oof, 1992 through my graduation. So two years of pre-K, kindergarten, and then first through 12th grade. Um, I wouldn't, ooh, it's hard to sort of boil it down and say that it was definitely systemic racism because I think things that Angel brought up, there's definitely a more community aspect to Cape Henry and, you know, people protecting each other. And I remember Dr. Richardson being a real spearhead of that um, yes. the first half of my career there. But then I think when we changed headmasters uh, to the gentleman who came after Dr. Lewis, I think that became less of an important thing for him as much as it was, we need to get up enrollment, we need to make sure we're bringing in tuition dollars. And so when we came to him uh, with some of those same issues, it was less of a, okay, we're gonna figure out how to fix this and more of a, uh, well, if you could just let this one go by the wayside, I think we'll be okay if we can just talk to him privately or address this privately. Less of a, let's go at this problem that we see with you know people as young as, I saw it as soon as second grade. There was somebody, I was in the after school program, me and my best friend, Kyle, who's also African American. Um, somebody came up to us and told us to do his homework because we were black. And of course, we at first, we're second graders. This is our first experience with any kind of racial thing. So we're just like, are we really supposed to do his homework? Or is that? So we go to the leader of the after school program, who happened to be Kyle's mom. And then that snowballed into something else where it had to become something that was addressed with everybody as opposed to just isolated to that incident. And then it happened again with actually the same kid in fifth grade telling me that I would make a good slave because I was tall and I was black and I was strong and blah, blah, blah. And another time where I didn't really react, but the people around me reacted. So, you know, other people who are in my class are saying, why are you saying that? Which made me feel good at the time. But again, it wasn't really addressed in a way that made it seem like that was the last time I'd have to deal with. It. So I'd say that, you know, it was off and on. I would never say that the school itself was racist, but it had some bad actors. And I don't think they were ever really given the kind of reprimand uh, for their behavior uh, in the same way that maybe they would if it happened today um, or if even if it had happened before Dr. Lewis got there. Um, I was the president of the Students United to Embrace Diversity the last three years I was there and really the only thing we were responsible for was the Martin Luther King Jr. Assembly. Like they wouldn't really let us do much of anything else outside of well what normal clubs can do in terms of fundraising and activities. Um, they never really gave us the time to, you know, it wasn't like a weekly thing where I can go up here and speak about this and that and the other. It was more like we're going to give you these spaces to have your discussions and we're going to give you uh, a time in which you could possibly address the entire student body. But other than that, it's not really something that's on our radar. Um, and again, you know, it's just little things. I know right before I graduated, they sent out a mailer um, and of course front and center was my group of friends, which was extremely diverse, you know, we had an Asian guy, an Indian guy, me, but then I looked at the picture again, and I had been photoshopped into the picture twice. So I appeared once on the left side and once on the right side, and it was hanging right before you get to the headmaster's office as you walk through the front hallway. And I had to point it out to somebody before they went back and changed it. So again, it was like little things that built up over time where it spoke to a more systemic problem than maybe people realized. Um, but to me, they all seemed like isolated incidents because the people around me didn't necessarily always act that way. So it was hard to say at the time, and I think the, the growth that I've seen after leaving school and maybe in college, um, and now you know the, the current moment being able to talk about it openly with other people has made it a little bit more obvious that there was a bigger problem than maybe even I realized even with my experiences. But Alex, you said, you said that you went to Cape Henry from pre-K to 12th grade, right? Yes. You felt, though, the need to join, become president of this diversity club for your last three years. Was there, why was it important for you to do? 
Uh, well, I'd been a member since I had gotten into high school, that, you know, ninth grade. Um, a, because that was like the black club at first. Um, and I think as it got a little bit bigger, it sort of the membership definitely diversified and we started to look into more uh, issues that went beyond just race. And we started talking about things like sexual orientation and class and things like that. Um, but when it started, it was really just like, okay, what clubs am I going to join? Well, a lot of the black people are in this club, so I'm going to go here. Um, and the president at the time was the big sister of one of my sister's best friends. Um, so I had known her before that. And she kind of sort of pitched it to me um, before that. And then when I joined, I saw, you know, all these people here were having these discussions. We all sort of have the same experiences. How can we make this a little better? How can we push this agenda forward? Um, our student, our 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 faculty leader um, was the chorus director, Dr. Logan, um, who we always had a good relationship with. So his room always felt like a safe space for us to go and, you know, talk about anything that was going on, even if we didn't feel that way, maybe, you know, in the lunchroom or in Dr. Lewis's office or things like that. So I think maybe that was uh, all sort of coalesced into being a part of it. And also yeah. just wanting to address things that had happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. And Aaron, I see you, you're nodding your head <laughs> over there. Do you, uh, do you have anything to add just about your experience, experience at Cape Henry? Yeah, sure. So Aaron Moore, class of 2007. Um, I was there from ninth grade to, you know, when I graduated. So 2004-ish to, you know, 2007. Um, I would say that my experience is a little bit different than those who were there longer, being that I was in the public school um, realm for, you know, up until middle school. And the reasons why my, you know, my mom was very much not trying to allow me to go to say Green Run High School at the time because of just the bad reputation that it had for, um, you know, just gang violence and, and other things like that. People not really, you know, coming out successful. now. Who knows, I was in middle school. I had the choice between going to Princess Anne High School and the IB program and, and Cape Henry. And my mom ultimately said, go to Cape Henry. So I would say that, you know, I, I, had, I had experienced like racist type comments, but not really when I was in public school. And then when I got to Cape Henry, ninth grade, it was, it was very much a culture shock for me being that I went from a school um, Plaza Middle School that was predominantly black. It didn't really have any successful programs. I mean, it, it classed off everyone from the smart team to everyone else. You know, that's the way they did it. And then I go to Cape Henry. Everyone, for the most part, you know, they're very intelligent people. But that's when I started to see and hear more just, just different, like, comments. You know, if you don't like it here, you shouldn't have come. Like, like it was my choice. And, you know, that was, that was, that was like, the first month when I was in ninth grade. Um, so, you know, just different things like that, you know, that, and that, that you know, it's, you know, I don't remember exact, um, you know, phrases or things people had said, but I do remember just how they made me feel. You know, that was kind of the, the, like, I can't, I, I don't know if I'm okay to feel the way I feel being that, you know, everyone's openly quoting, you know, Dave Chappelle at the time. And, you know, they think it's okay. It's, you know, and I, that may have been a, a, a culture thing of, of our time frame, but it, for me, you know, one thing I remember always getting picked on is why am I always so angry? Why am I always so quick to, you know, to, to spout off on someone when they said something that, you know, was really disrespectful. And it's, for me, it, it's because I never had to deal with, you know, a lot of just, just different pieces of racism. So I didn't know how to really take it. I just kind of yeah. was like, all right, well, and I already, I kind of feel like I'm like, like what Alex said, I'm included by a certain group of individuals, you know, Asian guy, white guy, you know, just, just people, right. Just people to me. And then, then you have the other groups where they're, they're really much like, Oh, well, you can hang out with us if you want to play sports. But other than that, I'm not going to talk to you. Wow. And it wasn't really an inclusive environment for me outside of, you know, the, the, the immediate people that were nice to me. Right. So, you know, the people on this call, I, I, I never had an issue with. I mean, they, you guys were always very nice, you know, to me, but, you know, it's, it's just, it was always interesting when you heard it from, when you've never had to hear it before, and then all of a sudden now you're being told you're not really welcome because, like, as if I had a choice, 
in the ninth grade to go to your school. I just wanted, you know, my mom just wanted to get a better education for me. That was her big thing. And so just like with Angel, you know, we had our, you know, financial aid and they had this other program. We had to go to the, you know, go to their house and um, stuff to, to allow me to, to get through school. And it, I would say from, from the teachers, I don't, I don't really remember ever having any teachers that I would say had, you know, any sort of racial, racial type of issues. I mean, they, they were all very much welcoming for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're teachers, right? They, they just care for their students. That's what, that's how I felt. It, it so, was mainly the, the, the students, you know, not everyone, but there was a group of them. So it was more of a culture shock than to you, just starting sure. school as opposed to Alex, you starting in pre-K. So just different, different experiences, obviously, with that, you coming later on. I think I was one of eight, maybe. One of, one of nine, right? And then... You know, it's like, you, I get the jokes, and since I'm, I'm half black, half white, I get the joke, well, you're only half, you know, and my brother, oh, well, he's the other half, so that's one, you know, but, you know, the way that, the way you're looked at isn't, isn't whether you're half or whole, it's, it's just you're a person, that's how I see it, and, you know, I, I just, I don't know, it's, it's kind of gotten to the point where I kind of try to just suppress a lot of the feelings on that, because, you know, if I'm always looked at as the angry guy, then, you know, what, what, where's that going to get me, so, it's better just to make sure that I, I speak up for what's right with a clear mind and make sure, hey, look, I don't agree with what you say. And from this point, I'm not going to be friends with you. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Natalie, Kristen, you guys, um, did you know that some of your classmates were feeling this way? Um, so I'm Natalie Parmenter. I attended Cape Henry from 6th through 10th grade, uh, and I would have been class of 08, so 2001 through 2005. Um, I think just being a, a white student, I had a definitely different experience, and I felt like there was a lot of tokenism going on. Like Erin said, there were a handful of kids in the high school that were Black, um, and I mean, they there were a handful of kids that weren't white as well, but predominantly you're white. So, or the population was white. So I think I viewed a lot of tokenism going on. Like, you know, you could kind of feel it like on the website or in the pictures around the school, like Alex was saying, like, let's make sure there's somebody who isn't white in some of these pictures or, um, you know, maybe you were reading a, a book about civil rights and you could kind of see like eyes shifting to the black kid in your class to see what they might say or what they might think or um i think i agree like i don't think the teachers were picking on kids or or making anything uh, feel systemic but i also think there was a lack of addressing things or teaching people how to talk um because you would hear about these incidences or maybe kind of witness something, it would just be like brushed under the rug and move on and hope that whoever was the target of a comment just wouldn't say anything, right? Or maybe the guidance counselor would come and help, but you never hear another um, piece of that. Um, whereas if you saw somebody was maybe struggling with depression or um, I think gay rights it was a really big issue when we were in school those seem to be talking points that people were a lot more willing to address and, and talk about as a community but but like people just wanted to be colorblind I guess and pretend that there wasn't any sort of dynamic going on between the the different colors and ethnicities of people at our school yeah Kristen, do you have um, anything to add? Because I know that you were one of the three here in this, this interview that helped craft the letter. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I was going to start talking. Um, yeah, so I'm Kristen Nixon. I was formerly Kristen Prophet. I went there from kindergarten through 12th grade with a few breaks for Princess Anne's IB program and Norfolk Academy, briefly. Um, what I will say is, I think, I have a weirdly unique perspective here in that I went there for a long time and then I sent my child there last year for kindergarten. Uh, well, I guess 
the year before last at this point. Um, and I pulled her because I did. I, I saw some classism first, and then I started to see this undercurrent of racism from other parents. Um, so I'm not even answering the question you asked me here, but, but in the beginning of this, I got an email that was meant for parents and it was the address, the initial like addressing of the state of our nation essentially. And I hated the message. And in this perfect storm of circumstances, I happened to interact with Natalie, Natalie with the age <laughs> for a minute about that. And I was like, this is totally inadequate. And she was like, do you know if they've sent anything out? So I screenshotted it to her I'm like they did. And and it's interesting you shouldn't ask because I was in the middle of sort of grappling with, well, what do we do with this information knowing that this was completely inadequate, you know? Um, but having grown up in Cape Henry, I, I would echo what everyone else has said, or not everyone else, everyone else that's white has said, in that I didn't know. There was a lot of tokenism and I saw that for the problem it was, but I didn't, I didn't know what to do about it. And I don't feel like those tools were ever given to us as students. I mean, they were definitely, I think, maybe like Natalie said, um, we would hope that like it wasn't addressed or that maybe our guidance counselor would wanna address some of this, but it wasn't. And I will say, I think the teachers there that I interacted with had big hearts. They were good people. Um, they weren't all white, that was great. But there were things that were said that were very problematic. And I, can, I won't forget them because at Cape Henry, one of the things that we do or did was the senior speech. And my best friend at the time had done anti-racial profiling and I was in AP English and I was told that I would be doing pro-racial profiling <laughs> and my grade was on the line and I said no I can't I can't write about that and she was like well it would indicate that you are a good strong writer if you could argue for something you feel passionately against and it was made clear to me that that was where I would get an A and so I did it and I still didn't get an A and I talked about it afterwards and it felt like crap, to be completely honest. Like I felt like I sold my whole self out because I thought that my grades rested on it. So I saw, I saw that racism for what it was in the moment when it was too late. And so I think that maybe is a big reason why I feel so drawn to this topic now is that like, that was totally unacceptable. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, who did everyone sign the letter that's on the group chat now? I did. Yeah. Um, knowing that the school alumni, you guys, you called the school out. Was that first statement, you said it was just, it wasn't strong enough. They weren't saying the right words. When they responded saying that, you know, our black students, our black teachers, we stand with you guys. How did you feel that they actually listened to the letter that was sent out and then responded and changed it? I feel like that's reflective of the Cape Henry that I know and love. Um, when I was there, um, in hindsight, I probably should have uh, kept my mouth quiet, but that's not my character. So I was always petitioning for something. In fact, at one point I petitioned the headmaster, we don't, I don't know if we use that term anymore, but to allow me to not take PE. And I won. So I didn't have to take PE for high school because I was asthmatic, right? So. I say that to say that if I had felt like there was some serious racism going on, I probably would have stepped up and said something, but I think I associated it all with curiosity. Cause like, I remember, what was the question? I don't remember what you asked me now. <laughs> but Basically just knowing that Kate Henry, after seeing your, your letter, um, knowing that they were willing to learn willing to listen and they they basically came out with a new statement saying like I feel like they've always been that way and and maybe there was a headmaster in between between Dr. Richardson and Dr. Lewis and where we are now because I live in Florida now so I'm not as um uh, in the know as I right. once was but I feel like we've always had a platform anytime we've gone to any any leaders at Cape Henry and said we I have an issue at least I have They've always listened to me. And maybe the squeaky wheel gets the oil, I'm not sure. But I've never gone there and said, I feel upset or offended about something and not had it addressed. So I'm glad that they did that. And I'm not, I guess I, I am surprised, but I'm, I expected them to do that because that's how they've always been. Yeah. So. I'm still not sure you answered the question. What, no, you did. You definitely did. What do you guys think needs to happen now? What type of changes do you want to see 
for, you know, for future dolphins to make sure, to ensure that they had a different experience than, um, you know, some of the, some of the bad experiences that I'm hearing today. What, what do you think needs to happen and needs to change? Well, I know one thing that happened actually while I was there, which speaks to Angel's point on how they've usually been pretty proactive about this stuff. Um, there was actually a group of parents who got together and created their own outside organization called PAS, uh, the Parents of African American Students. And we would meet at somebody's house, I think it was every other Friday or every third Friday of the month. And it would just be, they would get all of the black families from the school together and they would do things, you know, either for the kids, we're gonna go to, I don't know, the museum, or we're just gonna go out to the park and have a cookout, or we're going to this person's house, but. Uh, there will be, we'll have signups for some offsite tutoring or whatever. Um, they had a scholarship they created by the time I graduated. Um, so I would say if the school could maybe take steps to where that relationship, if it still exists or if it doesn't, um, you know, rekindle it, sort of create a pipeline for which they can A, have some way to talk about the issues that are affecting African American families and students at the school, but then also sort of in input their ideas because I know when I was in elementary school one thing they used to do that I always really enjoyed was they did every class would have a presentation on uh, the different holidays that were coming up in December so it wouldn't just be Christmas they would have I know one of my classmates Lizzie Wagner her mom Jody Wagner is now running for mayor of Virginia Beach but she came in <clears throat> excuse me and did a talk on Hanukkah and brought in latkes and we you know made our own latkes and ate them my mom did a Kwanzaa presentation <clears throat> somebody did a Ramadan one. So if they can do things like that, where they sort of input ideas from those families and those students that aren't feeling heard in ways in which they can, you know, bringing in black authors was something they used to do, um, bringing in black artists. And, you know, there were a lot of things that Cape Henry used to do that they stopped doing around the time I graduated. And mm -hmm. you know, it might have been a, a function of the economic times, you know, this was 2007, 2008. So we're going into a financial crisis um, or it could have been just, you know, it fell by the wayside, but they have always been reactive in the way that Angel said. And I think if they got back to that and just sort of started um, inputting more things, not just into the curriculum, but into the, the school culture at large, um, you know, we could get back to sort of the idealistic Cape Henry that we kind of remember from our childhoods. Yeah. I think to jump off of that too, Alex, um, you know, we want to make sure that the school is moving forward from uh, this concept of like just heroes and holidays and is really infusing their curriculum with a deep sense of, you know, just being anti-racist and, you know, loving diversity. And I think that Cape Henry really shows that with their nexus trips that they do to other countries. And I think they really go out of their way to try and um, get the international community to be interested in coming to our school. Um, so I would love to see, you know, commitment to, you know, promoting books in the library that have kids of all different backgrounds featured in the stories, you know, studying people, uh, different role models from different backgrounds, uh, just things like that to open the eyes. I think it's really easy, particularly in history and literacy courses, just to focus in on uh, people and characters and stories that are white. Um, and for Cape Henry and for all schools, I'd love to see that commitment, that step forward, just to focus in on Americans or all people um, so that it doesn't feel like you've missed out on a history. I think all of us could probably say with the environment and conversation that started on a nation that we've learned about major historical events that were completely skipped in history books. Mm -hmm. I know I've certainly learned a lot of things in the past mm -hmm. few weeks and I, I would love to see um, those those stories and the history infused in the curriculum, because uh, I think that would really take the academic academics at Cape Henry to the next level. Yeah. yeah. And it, to build off of that, I think uh, my experience at Cape Henry was a little different. I'm Natalie Bank, by the way, uh, class of 07, and I went to Cape Henry from the beginning of 2005 till I graduated in 07. And I actually came to Cape Henry from Europe. So I think um, I also had a culture shock <laughs> just because I was suddenly in America. Um, and uh, I, n I re just very much recall uh, knowing that 
the majority of Virginia, well, not majority, but a really big portion of Virginia Beach and Norfolk populations were people of color, and that those ratios weren't necessarily reflected in the school. And it was just sort of a, um, it just felt like that was just a given because of the wealth that uh, most people at Cape Henry had acquired. So that was something that really stood out to me. Um, but at the same time, I feel like back then the school, other than maybe MLK Day or Black History Month, I think they did a little bit, um, I did, they did multiple assemblies if I re recall co correctly. Um, but I think color blindness was sort of the, the creed I agree. The just sort of the assumption that you don't talk about, about color you are um, instead of acknowledging that the experience for uh, people of color in America is inherently different than that of, of most white people in America. Mm -hmm. And I think going forward, if you can see me, it's a connection. I know it's freezing up a little um, bit. Going forward, I would like to see Cape Henry sort of move away. Oh, I'm sorry. That's really terrible timing. Is I don't it, know, it's oh, good, what it's good now. <laughs> it's okay, fine. should it's I fine. pick back up somewhere? Sorry, no, no. you're good. <laughs> okay, um, going forward, I would like to see America, uh, or America, <laughs> big wishes here. I would like to see Kate Henry um, uh, focus on, uh, or be, be, more, be more explicit about, about that. And instead of saying, you know, we're colorblind and that just sort of being like non-racist instead going, no, there are definitely differences in your experience as an American if you are, have a, a skin color that is not white. And I think the black community in particular has a lot of extra uh, dimensions added to that experience. Um, and I would like to see them acknowledge that and commit to anti-racism. Right, right. I, I just think that, that the whole... racism that I guess is the, yeah, what I think, which is something like we talked about that Angela Davis said, you know, in 1970, and I think that's still so valid today. And I do, I am hopeful that Cape Henry will do that. The conversations we've had so far definitely lead us to think that's the case. Um, but I think as a white person at Cape Henry, it was so easy to not have to acknowledge it or see it. And that's not great for black people. That's also not great for white people because you're not seeing what life is really like and you're not really learning about your fellow humans if, if that's how your culture exists. Yeah. And I think a lot of that I didn't see until after I left. And you didn't realize it until after graduating and getting older. Yeah, there were definitely moments, um, Aaron actually told me about stuff that had happened that I didn't acknowledge at the time. I didn't understand it or uh, I'm not sure. Well, I am sure I didn't, I think I didn't want to believe it because I couldn't imagine people still being racist. And I'm um, really regretful of that. Uh, and it wasn't until later that I realized my, what my whiteness in a, in a system means that is not, it's designed for my whiteness and not for people of other skin colors. Yeah. I know, I know everyone's really busy. So I'm trying to, <laughs> I know I try to do it around lunch to make sure everyone can make it. But um, just having this open conversation, I don't know why talking about race is so hard, but this is, I feel like this is just very tough right now. So I just appreciate you guys. I, I just feel like all of you are just incredibly brave speaking out. Um, what is your biggest hope from this conversation, from this story, from the letter? What's your biggest hope? Which, what do you wanna see come out of this? Anyway. My biggest hope is that the conversation will continue. Um, the conversations will continue. I feel like the dialogue is so important right now. And I know when I was in Cape Henry in 2007, I did my senior speech on driving while black. And at the time I did it, I think just to um, take a stand, you know, and be kind of controversial, but it was, it was very real even then. And it wasn't really spoken about as much then, but um, I just think we need to keep the dialogue going and people need to be able to ask those questions so that we can understand that we're more alike than we are different. And um, I just want to rain on the side. I remember one time when I was in 10th grade, Miss Frazier's geometry class, I had a weave in 
And somebody asked about this weave that I had in, and we spent the entire bell talking about black women's hair. And they got to, and uh, you know, there was like eight people in the class. Let's not pretend it was a lot of people, but all eight people in that class got to understand what it means for a black woman to have all these different styles that you see, you know, that don't come easily, by the way. Alex, I'll say your hair looks very good, by the way. You're making me look bad. I keep trying to fix mine because yours is looking so much better than mine. But anyway, I just think it's the dialogue. We have to keep talking to each other. We have to keep asking those questions and having those uncomfortable questions, un uncomfortable conversations so that people can understand where we're all coming from. Because I think we all want the same thing at the end of the day. It's just how do we get there? Yeah. What a question. How? And it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of hard work. But I feel like starting these conversations, I feel like that's a start. We have to start somewhere. And I, I feel like this all helps, I guess. I don't, I don't even know. I think it does. I think it does. Yeah, I, I posted something after the sort of the protest started on Facebook that got a little bit of traction. But the one thing that I was most affected by was that I was getting messages from people I went to school with saying, you know, what you wrote was really powerful to me because I didn't even know you had those experiences. And now I'm re-examining, you know, my experience at Cape Henry through that lens. And so now I can give that knowledge to my children or to the people around me and sort of reevaluate how I'm acting. People that I never had a problem with, people that were friends of mine, people that I hung out with, they were even saying like, I never knew this was going on because we didn't talk about it. And maybe that was part of the problem. Like Angel said, if it, the conversation can continue like that where people are sort of re-examining their own personal biases, even for me, um, you know, things that I said and did in high school that were less than, I know I'm not immune to having said stupid things when I was 16. Um, if you can go back and, you know, learn from those experiences and sort of grow from them, that's all we can ask from anybody really is the, if you're given the opportunity to learn some new information and change, then if you don't, then yes, maybe be condemned, but you shouldn't be condemned for attempting to do so. Yeah. Alex, your post actually was a huge inspiration for me to uh, jump on board with what Natalie and Kristen were talking about. Um, done a lot of reflecting on my own adult life and you know experiences with racism as an adult, but I hadn't really gone back to think about what I witnessed as a child. You know, you like to protect your childhood and think that you were just kind of skipping down the halls of your middle school and high school. Um, and it made me really stop and think how much I'd been exposed to before I even graduated from school. Um, and it, I think it inspired a lot. I, some of my hopes, I hope that um, I hope that Cape Henry continues on its trajectory to be an anti-racist establishment. I hope that Cape Henry becomes a model for other private schools in the community, or maybe public schools too, uh, making it realize that if you put intention into things, you can actually make change and make a better environment. Uh, but it does take that pain of talking through and working through the past or people's current beliefs. Um, and I hope that you know, when people see this on the news too, they just pause to stop and think and listen and reflect. It's hard to change, it's hard to move forward, but um, it's 2020. <laughs> if people are telling you something is wrong, you gotta just listen, to put your pride aside and, and move forward and let's make a better country. Yeah. Alex, what was your post? Uh, it was I, I didn't hear really yeah, it was really just detailing some of the experience I've talked about here and sort of um, the lens through which I viewed growing up in that environment and then what that meant to me to see, you know, the things that I was seeing in terms of the protests and, you know, George Floyd and bring sort of all those things into it, you know, how it's not just enough to condemn those things, you also have to condemn those tiny little steps along the way. You know, it's not just one thing that takes a person from being completely anti-racist to being a complete, you know, segregationist. It is little tiny things that happen over time that people let them get away with or don't address or don't bring up. And I was just sort of speaking to, you know, if you see those things, it's not enough now for all of us to just say that's bad. You have to actually go and deal with that issue up front and, you know, as it happens, not as a reflection. Do you think, uh, 
Black people who go to predominantly white schools, do you think right now they have a unique position of acting like a bridge? You know what I mean? I feel yes. like um, some of the majority of my white friends, I feel like I'm one of their only black friends, you know, and me, That's me. speaking up, telling <laughs> my experiences, how I felt going to a predominantly white school from first to 12th grade. Um, they didn't know when they didn't know that I was feeling like this. And I feel like they would never, I feel like I'm their only black friend. You know what I mean? They can't hear this from other people. Is mm -hmm. that we're in a position of acting like a bridge? Absolutely. Um, Natalie Banks said something to me the other day that it, uh, I can't, I'm going to cry just thinking about it. But she mentioned emotional labor. And I guess I had never thought about it that way. But the amount of emotional labor that Black people have to put forth to bridge that gap. Because yes, we went to, I went to an all-white school for those seven years. But now I work in all-white corporate America, right? So that hasn't stopped. I haven't, I'm not any less of a bridge now than I, I was then. I'm still going through the same things. I'm still, I just went to HR last week to try to figure out why we haven't gotten one email regarding anything that's going on, you know? So I feel like, yes, we are the bridge, especially those of us who went to a predominantly white school because we tend to be able to relate more to both communities, uh, if you want to call them separate communities, they, they, they are, you know? So even between the people I hang out with and the family that I have, you know, because some of my siblings, siblings didn't go to the same school that I went to, I'm a bridge even there, you know, and so oh, yeah. it's tiring. It's tiring. I mean, I've had to turn off the news. I've had to get rid of all of my social media apps off my phone. You know, it's tiring to constantly be the person that has to stand up and say, well, you know, the police brutality is not really comparable to the violence in South Side Chicago because I don't live in the South Side of Chicago and I don't fit any of the, uh, of the uh, lifestyle decisions that the people in the South Side of Chicago have made. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not, a, you know, the people who are shooting each other in Chicago, for the most part, are people who live in a different lifestyle than those, you know, that I have chosen. So yes, I'm constantly having those conversations. I mean, several times a week. And now I'm, my friends, my white friends are all texting me or calling me, the ones that are very close to me, asking me, are you okay? What can I do to fix this? Which has meant a lot to me. I, I've gotten several messages like that. Like, I, I don't know what to tell my kids. What should I tell my kids? And while those messages are welcomed, that is emotionally tiring because I have to have all the answers and I don't always have the answers. I don't know. I don't have children. So I'm not sure what to tell them, you know? know so I, yeah. I can relate to that. You know, I, my, some of my white friends are saying, well, what should I read? What should I do? What, and I'm like, I was in the same class with y'all. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you know, and so I think it's just right now, everyone is educating themselves, yeah. everyone. Right. And it's hard, it's tiring and it's hard and it's, it's stressful because I'm like, I'm making sure I say the exact right things that's relatable, that you understand what I'm saying, that it doesn't sound like I'm attacking white people because I'm not, you know, and it, it feels like that sometimes. And I'm like, it's not that way. There's a couple people who are bad but it's not all white people. My family's multiracial, so it's not that, you know? And so it's, it is, it's, it's emotionally, it's a lot of emotional labor, I'll say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If I, if I can build on that. Oh, sorry, oh. I think we talked at the same time. I think so too. <laughs> um, if I can build on that, I, um, I, I, I mean, I think as white people, we need to be super sensitive to that um, in the sense that you can't demand this emotional labor. And um, Aaron, Alex, Angel, you're here now and you're, you're, you're sharing very personal feelings and personal experiences um, at the behalf of the people who are watching this, at the behalf of us, we're allowed to, you know, we're, we're, we're allowed to listen to you and learn from you. And, and I'm so grateful for that. But I don't think as white people, that's something we can demand from our um, black and POC peers. Um, there are a lot of black people out there that are offering up their experiences that are helping educate white people and, and any other people in their communities that are offering resources. And I think it's up to us to, to look for those and learn from those. Um, 
but uh, and, and if people offer it, listen, <laughs> be grateful. And if you can, maybe even pay for it um, because, because it is labor, just like Angel was saying. And I don't think that's yet, a, a, it's a white race, white people created racism, white people created these systems and white people are the ones still benefiting from these systems. Even if there are zero racists, uh, this is what I read the other day, even if there are zero racists cre uh, keeping the system up, the system is still racist and that's that's where the problem lies so 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 <laughs> we can't put the burden of solving racism on the people that racism oppresses and again if people offer up their experience and like right now i'm so grateful thank you all for for sharing um but i think as a as a t just talking to the white viewers here and the and the non-black viewers who are maybe feeling called upon um uh, it's, I think it's up to us to do the work and that includes listening to people who are ha happy to share their experiences, but we can't demand, we can't demand those things. I don't think. Yeah. Oh, I keep talking right when someone else talks. I'm sorry. You asked earlier, what is our, our hope out of this for Cape Henry moving forward? And to jump off of what Angel and Natalie said, I think that I would like to see not only all of the things that everyone has talked about, because those are just exceptionally important, I think, for people of color, students at Cape Henry, they need those outlets, they need places where they can address all of this. But I would like to see the faculty be a little bit more burdened with their own unlearning of some of their racism and their own learning of how to move forward. I think that, you know, we're talking about emotional labor. I think that they should absolutely bring in people of color to speak to their experiences, but they should compensate them. Otherwise, it's not okay to ask, in my opinion. And I, I just, I think that there's so much that could be done, you know, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what it looks like to form an anti-racist curriculum or reform a curriculum to address all of this. But I do know that as a therapist, I work with white people every day right now that feel fragile and there are good books to address that. And they, that's where they need to take it, you know? And so that is my greater hope. My greater hope is we're either compensating someone for their emotional labor or we are requiring it of faculty because there is a lot that needs to be learned and unlearned. Yeah. Any, anybody else want to, uh, anything that you feel that I didn't ask, that we didn't touch on, get off your chest, anything at all that you want to say? I can just, uh, I guess just from my point of view, um, and, and Kristen can relate possibly on this, but, you know, I have two young kids, you know, I have one that one's turning five, the other one's turning two. And it's, it's hard to think about, you know, how do I have these conversations when he's asking these questions? You know, he comes to me and you know, I pick him up just last week and he said, the white cops are bad, daddy. And I said, wait, that's not. I don't even know where you picked that up, but that's that's not the, the facts, okay? There's there's bad cops, there's good cops. It doesn't matter what color they are, but it's like he's five. I mean, he, was, he just finished pre-K. He's going into kindergarten now, you know, the next year. And, you know, how do I have that conversation with him when he just thinks cops that are white and then they're also blue and green and red, just like Power Rangers. I mean, that's what he thinks, but it's like, how do I have that conversation? And And so the more that I think about what my expectation is from not just Cape Henry, but anyone that would be able to just see and read and, and really feel this is that they just recognize and acknowledge, you know, acknowledge, acknowledge that, that there's something that's hurting and that maybe it wasn't you directly. And we know a lot of people, they're, they're very quick at pointing the finger because, you know, they don't, they don't feel it's their responsibility or they don't feel that they were part of the problem. They, it wasn't that they developed it themselves, right? It wasn't them that, that was doing it, but collectively when, when they don't have to experience the same hurt or discrimination that occurs, you know, when they're getting the job over the next person, or if they're getting the looks first, they don't see that. They just say, well, I worked harder, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm constantly fighting, you know, just, some were friends and now they're no longer friends in some cases, but I'm constantly finding just people on social media, you know, just people that are, you know, that I've known and I'm having these conversations like, do you really blame the victims for putting, for them being in a situation 
that got them killed. And, and you know, I'm fighting these things, knowing that my son's going to have to be there one day, knowing that I was there one day where, I, you know, when I, when I went to ODU, I got pulled over randomly all the time on my way home from work. And they would just start asking these awkward questions. And I said, I have my work shirt on. It's, I mean, it's, it's got a big AT&T logo. It's not even, it's, it's like nine o'clock at night. What do you think I'm doing? Well, have you been drinking? No. Okay, we'll step out of the car. Okay, great. Now I'm in a situation again. So it's like it happened so often that, you know, I just, I don't want my son to have to grow up in something like that. And being that all we talk about today is racial issues and COVID-19, I've got to have these conversations with him now because he hears it. Mm -hmm. He hears it all the time. And my daughter is on the way. She's learning words. So, you know, that, that'll be the next one. And, and that, that's all I hope. I, I hope that whatever I, whatever comes out of this, whatever I do today, it, it helps for a better future for him and her. Yeah. I mean, anyone else, anyone that you just have anything else to say that you think I missed at all, didn't ask, about, didn't touch on? I know you guys are busy, but. Well, the only thing I would say is I do know that we're, Cape Henry isn't the only school that had this issue in the area. Uh, my cousin is went to Nansman Suffolk Academy and they did something very similar where they ended up sending a letter to the headmaster. Mm -hmm. There's actually a lot more um, underlying within like the naming of buildings at that school that I had no idea about, you know, having gone there for games and tennis matches or whatever throughout the years that I had no idea about. So in terms of this being this addressed across the TCIS brand of schools, I think maybe that there's a lot more going on than just maybe us sending that letter. There might be multiple situations where this is happening. Oh, absolutely. I just, I came across you guys first. So <laughs> I, I reached out and you guys are willing to talk and you shared some names. So um, I, yeah, I think this is happening across the country, really. Um, I'm also I, seeing on social media, like, um, you know, the school's name or black school's name. Uh, that's on Instagram, and I know that that's on uh, some of the universities. I know the University of Georgia is doing it, and people are just kind of sharing their experiences, how it was at these schools, and um, reading through some of them. It's just, it's crazy how relatable, you know, some of the experiences have been. Um, it's, it's just a crazy, tough, weird time that we're all in right now, you know, but I, I really think it is vital to do what you guys are doing today. And that's speaking up, speaking out, and just letting your voice be heard so you can create change. I really appreciate this platform. I really appreciate you putting this together as well. Um, I trust that Cape Henry will do the right thing because they've done that in the past. And it really is an amazing school. Like, I, I wish there was one here so that if I had kids, I could send them there. It, it by far is the standard of what school should be, at least to me. Um, so I, I have faith they're going to do the right thing. And I also think that eventually this will grow beyond just the thousand kids that go to Cape Henry because there's so many powerful people who send their kids there or who are um, somehow connected to people there. So they have a huge platform. And if they really started an anti-racism campaign, I think they could reach far beyond the thousand kids that go to that school because there's a lot of powerful people there, you know, that have huge platforms. So I think this could really grow into something beyond just Mill Dam Road, Cape Henry, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Any, anybody else? You think that's, you think that's it? Yes. Anybody? Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you guys so much.